JR McKee, yeah. man, I appreciate you being on today. Appreciate your time. I'm excited to get to interview you uh, about your new book, which is called 10 Artist Commandments. You could see it in the background on the shelf behind Jerry McKee's head. Uh, I don't have the physical copy. I did get it on Audible. Listen to the whole thing. Uh, definitely offers a lot of great information, and that's coming from somebody that's read at least 20 different books or listened to 20 different books, specifically in the music industry. Everything from personal stories of A-list artists and huge executives in the game, all the way to very technical uh, books like Donald Passman, for example. He wrote a book called All You Need to Know About the Music Business. Matter of fact, like 11 different volumes of it. Very technical right. in terms of legal and all that. A heavy read. But, you know, yours is, is shorter, obviously, but a lot of gems, put it that way. So, blessed to have you here today. Thank you for coming through. And we're going to get into, you know, who you are and what your book is. So, you know, no further ado. Please give a quick intro about who you are. And then I'll, let's get into the book, man. Well, sure. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is J.R. McKee. I've been in the music business for 19 years. Um, I was fortunate enough to get around some people who got a record deal, um, and they allowed me to kind of come along on their journey. Um, just as, you know, the, the, the smart friend, I was just trying to help them make business decisions. I didn't have any music business terms at the time, but I, I was technically their manager. Um, and so I got around them and just got to learn what the music business was and and I loved it, you know, I loved the lifestyle. And I was just like, how can I make this an actual business? Like who makes money off of music? And I realized it was the, the record label. So I immediately went and started a record label. Um, and so that's that was my entry into the business. I've now been doing that, um, like I said, for 19 years straight, um, sold over 160 million records, won multiple Grammys, um, multiple awards, man. Um, over the past, give you some like recent history, um 2020 we we broke right away little dirk i was a uh, head of digital sales and revenue at, at alamo when we did that 2021 um i signed money long to my own imprint um um blew up money long the hours and hours record um <clears throat> 2022 man what are we doing 2022 2022 french montana um, we gave him his first number one album um, since in over eight years, actually his first, and it's actually his first independent number one billboard album, not just number one on Apple, like number one on billboard. Um, 2023, we had the biggest song on TikTok in in America. It was called Justine Scott Collide. Uh, Collide. That was the biggest song on TikTok in 2023. Um, what we, what I did really special this year that I love is, is put out that La Russell album. We put out his album and sold $150,000 worth of worth the album straight to the consumer, straight to his fans. And that was amazing because it kind of foreshadowed the future of where we're headed now. Um, and so, yeah, I've just been in the music business, man, doing my thing, always independent, always with an entrepreneurial mindset. And that's what set me up to be able to uh, write this book. It's just helping people no matter where they are and what area they happen to be, live in, helping them become the best version of themselves and then turning that into a business. That's awesome. Let me ask you this, because, you know, I haven't written any books yet. Definitely is in my plans. How did this yeah. come about? Has been has this been like on your uh, calendar for a couple of years or this was uh, like the last couple of months spur of the moment thing that you had some time for? No. So so in 2020, I started, you know, educating people. I started putting out content um, for artists, like helping just just value add content, just giving them information on how to win in this game. Um, and I put out courses on how to win in this game. And so I realized in that process, I needed a, a, another way to reach more people quickly um, and at a more cost efficient, like a, a book for, you know, the audio book is $9.99, you know, so like everybody can have access to that. Everybody has $10. So I needed a more cost efficient way to reach everybody. It's kind of like when streaming came along, that was the most cost efficient way for an artist to reach the whole world. And so as an educator, the book is one of the most cost efficient ways. And so yeah. I, I knew I needed to create a book. Um, and, and and honestly, the the idea flew, I mean, flow very quickly. Like, you know, I knew I wanted to have a, a number. So I was thinking seven something, four something. And then, you know, um, I'm a Christian, so I read my Bible. So 10 commandments, I'm like, you know what? We'll do the 10 artist commandments. Like <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so, and so, yeah, so that's how we got it. And, and it, like I said, it flowed really quickly because I already knew what it took. Like 
that was one of the things that I knew before I wrote this book. It's like, I, I know I have the blueprint. Like I've done this so many times. I, I know. And so I was like, let me just put it on paper. And that, and that's what happened. That's dope. And I give you props on doing your own audio book. I love that because yeah. I think Ray Rawls just put out a super dope book like a year ago, you know, mm -hmm. on him being an entrepreneur. And it's probably his second one, but man, he, he missed the, he, he let somebody yeah, else do he it. He let somebody else do it. And like when 50 Cent put out his book, he did his own voice, which yeah. is dope because being able to listen to that person, it just, right. it's like a different relatability, in my opinion. It's like, it's coming from them and they're reading it. I think that's yeah. crucial. It's important. I, my, my thought process was just simply like any person who is a, a figure of any sort and people know your voice, then you have to do the book in your voice. Like if I was just an author that, you know, I had like a Donald Passman where like, I'm not out there talking all the time, then I don't need the audio book in my voice. But if you're a person where people know your voice, you, you have to, in my opinion, you have to do the audio book. Right. You know what I mean? But I, I will say, um, and, and this is a, good for you, uh, Mateus, like that thing is hard. It is very hard to do an audio book. And I did not realize it until I started doing it. It's like vocal exercises or breathing exercises. You actually need to have some sort of stamina to be able to read consistently for that long out loud. It, it was it was difficult, and then I had my own medical issues that made it even harder. Mm. But but it was worth it. How it was long did it take? How long did it? How many sessions? Uh, man, so I started. I probably did um, five sessions in my office. Um, and then we were supposed to be doing like punch ins. Like, you, you were you were an audio engineer, right? Yeah. Look, I was going to say the studio sit behind me. I've recorded yeah. three audiobooks with people, and it took, okay. you know, like five yeah. to 10 sessions, hours and hours. Yeah. And then, you know. So, we, well, we did like five sessions in the office. Then it was time to do punch ins. But when it came time to do punch ins, I got sick. I ended up catching pneumonia. Um, and so, when I caught pneumonia, um, the book was due the audiobook version because Amazon does not play. Like if you miss their deadlines, they'll they'll remove the book because I had already put it out for pre-order. Okay. And so once you set a date for pre-order, if you miss that date, they'll pull the book. Um and so I had no choice but to like try to finish the audiobook while I was in the hospital. Okay. And so I did two days in the hospital and then I did two days when I got out. So altogether that's four plus five nine sessions. Took nine sessions. I didn't realize, I mean, it sounds cohesive. It doesn't sound like you're sick. And, you know, yeah. and I would say, I'm sure you would probably have a different answer for this now, but on your second book, would you probably record the audio and have it written before you put it out for pre-release, release, all that, just have all well, that? Well, yeah, I learned that lesson. <laughs> I learned that lesson, um, you know, but but I had set the, the uh, release so far away. I, I thought I, I just didn't, I didn't plan on getting sick. That was really what right. would mess it all up is I got sick. Um, if I would have been sick, you know, it would have been everything would be okay. Um, but yeah, no. But for next time, I'll have it all ready for sure. Okay, no, that's dope. Yeah, we got a bunch of people that are uh, logging on, guys. Uh, welcome to the interview. Go ahead and start putting your questions uh, into the chat if you want me to ask them uh, to Jr. McKee as we're doing this interview. And then if he has time at the end, I will open it up to more of like a, a interactive uh, live Q and A, and some of you guys can unmute yourselves and things like that. But all right, so let's now jump into the book. And I love the 10 Artist Commandments. And I basically uh, kind of jotted down questions and interesting things you said out of each commandment. You know, I know they're not necessarily technical chapters because you got a chapter introducing the whole thing. You got the 10 commandments, which are a chapter each. And then I think there's like another one or two chapters like closing. Um, yeah. But let's get into the first one because I love this one. And this is a uh, mantra I try to just live by period since I was raised in Eastern Europe and coming to America and which is tell the truth be authentic you know mm -hmm. especially in entertainment right entertainment is entertainment people can act as something different they can portray characters but why do you right. believe for artists telling the truth is the number one commandment well there's so many reasons um number one you know your truth and your story that's that's a gift for you like but it's only a gift when you give it to somebody and so you have to tell it to give it to somebody, right? Because um, if you hold in your truth, then it, it, it can never become a gift. You have to give it away, and that's what makes it a gift. And so I, I think starting there, right, telling the truth. Um, then the other thing about it is what we're trying to do is make human connections. You know, nobody wants to believe that you're perfect. 
Right. When, when people see the human, meaning the, the flaws or the struggles that you go through, they automatically associate, oh, wow, they're going through something like me. And if they can make it, then I can make it. And that's what makes me a fan of them. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm seeing them go through what I went through and, and look at them still going. So now I have hope. You know what I mean? And mm. obviously, um, anytime you're trying to sell something, it's, it's all about creating an audience for that product. You know what I mean? So if I'm an artist trying to sell music, I need to create an audience for my music. Yep. Well, how do I do that? I do that by showing them I'm human. But any creative, but if I'm trying to create an audience for my paintings, if I'm trying to create an audience for my books, because I'm an author, like how do I attract people to me? I attract them to me by showing them I'm human. And so I have to tell the truth. And then you, you really have to know that authenticity can be seen through the phone. You know, we can hear it in your yeah. voice. You know what I mean? We can see it in your eyes. Like, oh my goodness, they really are going through this. Or they, or they, they really have been through this. They're being authentic. You know, when you're inauthentic, you attract inauthentic people. And that make and that person that you attract is going to be fickle. They're going to leave you as soon as the next thing come along. But if I've shared with you my battle with, you know, I have sickle cell. If I've shared with you my battle with sickle cell and you have sickle cell or you know somebody that has sickle cell or you're going through a similar ailment it may be a different disease but you understand my pain because you're dealing with that pain as well yeah now we have a bond yeah. i have formed a bond by telling you my truth and so now you'll go buy that book like i literally put out a post you know me i shared when i was in the hospital recording the audio book and that post that i put up outside of the day the book came out that post that day when that post went up that was the most books i ever sold and it had the post had nothing to do with necessarily me telling artists about how to sell um their art right. it was just about me telling my truth like man this is what i had to deal with and so there were comments literally you know i'm not even an artist but i'm going to go buy that book because i want to support you because i've been through what you're going through right now and so telling your truth is just the biggest gift you can have you just got to actually you know be vulnerable enough to do it um and so when, <laughs> excuse me when i start working with artists i always start with like their story who they are you know what I mean? Because I feel like if we can get to the most vulnerable parts of you and share it, then we're going to be able to win. You know what I mean? So if, if you're willing to be vulnerable, you're going to find an audience and that audience is going to support you because we want them to fall in love with you more than your music. Because yeah. if they like you, they'll support your music. But if they like the song, that doesn't mean they'll support you. That's, that's a so huge that's why that tell the truth is so important for any creative. Yeah, no, that's a huge gem. And you're right. Like, I remember I read this dope book. Um, I forgot the title of it, but I bought it because it was a gentleman who originally immigrated from South Korea to America in his early mm -hmm. teens, kind of like I did. And he was an insurance salesman. So, you know, it was, it was business. So that attracted me. But the fact that uh, the... Uh, preface was like talking about him struggling with having an accent and not getting accepted and just being ridiculed. I went through that in middle school and I bought that book just because of that. That That's because what connected that. with me. You, I was like, yeah, yeah, you bonded with him. Yeah. You bonded with him through his truth. Yep. So, yeah. so let me ask you this. Uh, can you give me some examples that you've witnessed personally in the music industry of where uh, faking it went wrong like when artists try to portray a lifestyle or something they were not and then it either abruptly uh ended their career or just it was not a good move on their part to do that um i wasn't a part of this scenario but obviously you have six nine um yeah. you go back to when i was a kid you have milli vanilli um you know what i mean like we we've seen that happen so many times you know right um I, i'm trying to think if i can think of more examples um the only person that I could say survive faking it till you make it is Rick Ross. That's the only person. But, but but let me tell you why. It's because he never wavered. He stood he stood on his character. He never once broke character. You know what I mean? I personally have met with Ross, talked to Rick Ross, and he's just a very intelligent man. And so he already understands this is the character I'm portraying to the world, and he's never broken that character. You know what I mean? And so I I adore him for that. Like, I'm like, okay, if you are going to fake it, you better stick with it forever. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially his circumstance, right? What what his yeah. initial job was and then what he portrayed on the right, right, right. So, yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, normally, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, eventually you'll get found out. And, and what I hate to see is when you have to start over because you're, you put yourself in a worse position than when you started because now there's a... A, a stigma to your name yeah. you know what i mean and so now you got to go change your name or, and do all kind of other rebranding 
So yeah, so I, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't advise that route. Right. No, for sure. And on, on that, keeping on that topic, would you? What would you say? Are there any suggestions you have for artists of certain topics of areas of uh, like politics or you know areas of uh, discussion or uh, public trends to stay away from if you're an artist, just to be careful with it? Man, you know, I've never got asked that question. That's a really good question. Um, it's 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 so like even I have to go through that, right? Like yeah. there are things that I I, I feel, but I, I just never state publicly. Right. You know what I mean? Um, I I hate to say out of fear, but I I, I just feel like it's unnecessary for me to stay public. If, if there was something that I needed to say, I wouldn't stop myself from saying it. But there are certain things like even though I feel that way or I agree with this person, it's unnecessary for me to voice that. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and so for me, I just look at it as is is this is this necessary for me to say? And so I, I think you'll get yourself in trouble saying things that you didn't even need to say. Right. Like nobody asks your opinion. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just keep your opinion to yourself, keep your opinion off offline is what I would advise when when it comes to that. But that has nothing to do with necessarily telling your truth. Right. You know, when you're giving your opinion, that you, that's 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 nothing to do with this is what I've been through. This is what I'm going through. So, so I would say that it's easy to separate the two. That's a good you point. Know I mean? yeah, that's a good um, point. You know, your your political stance isn't necessarily what you're going through, unless it is. And if it is, then voice it. Yeah. But if it's just your opinion, then it's unnecessary for you to voice it. Um, and you know, alienate yourself or detract people from you or attract the wrong people. So I would say if you're telling the truth, always speak on it. But if it's just an opinion, you don't need to give your opinion all the time. Right. And I guess everybody has seen an example of an artist in, in Kanye kind of do that when he starts talking about his political views and certain yeah. things. Maybe some of those he should have just kept that to himself. Or maybe right. not. I mean, you know, he is who he is. He's still successful, very rich. So maybe yeah. it doesn't matter that I mean, way, I, but... I, I would question if it's marketing. I don't know, but it, sometimes it comes off as just as just marketing. Like he wants his name in people's mouth right. so that he can sell whatever he's selling. And I don't know, but that would be that when I see that, that's my thought. I'm like, man, I wonder is is this part of his marketing strategy? Right. Um, and we got a good question that I saw here. But I'm going to ask it at the end. I'm going to keep yeah, keep the questions coming, guys. Um, so getting into the second commandment, which is telling your story. Uh, I want to ask you this because I saw a dope movie uh, on the plane uh, about uh, Whitney Houston's life while I was traveling yeah, I recently. Too. On the plane. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, and then that just reminded me of the movie I saw about Queen and all that. But the point I'm mm -hmm. making is that back in the day, the artist didn't necessarily tell the need, they didn't need to tell their personal story. Like just because right. they had a big label behind them, a lot of money, marketing dollars, especially Whitney, like she didn't even write her own songs. So mm -hmm. she was telling other people's stories kind of that she kind of related to until later she decided to, you know, kind of set the record straight. But in 2023 and 2024, because we're right around the corner, do you believe artists in 2024 even has the chance now, especially independently, of making it without telling the story? No. Okay. The biggest difference between then and, and now is media, right? Like back then, Whitney Houston, Clive Davis, he and all the other major labels, they were able to control the media. They controlled yeah. the CD stores, the radio, they controlled the um the television, right? And so at, at, in, that, in those times, their only job was to give the, the media a great product. That was their only job. If I can give you great product, it's going to sell. You know what I mean? But now we have zero control over the media. And so it's all decided by the fans. And if you want fans, you're going to have to tell your story because otherwise I have no reason to be your fan. You know, your music is not a strong enough hole when there's a hundred thousand songs coming out every day. Like I have a hundred thousand daily options. Why would I pick your music? I need something more to hold on to, you know, so I need your truth and I need your story to be able to hold on and say, okay, I'm a fan of them. Look at what they went through. Look at where they come from. You know what I mean? That, that story is, is too important now. Um, to to your success you need people to understand you need people to become fans and followers of you you know what i mean and members of your community and the only way to do that is to give them a reason yeah. and so your story is your reason so yeah so that's why it's necessary today like if we still control the media then it wouldn't matter 
But because we don't, and we have to depend on the fans choosing us, we need to give them a reason to choose us. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And in, in that chapter or the commandment number two, you, at the end of it, you talk about your story of starting the label. But let me ask mm -hmm. you this, you know, you're a very smart dude. Like, what was your plan? What, was that the initial dream you had since middle school, high school to be in the music industry? Or like, what, what, what would have been another path for you if that right. came about in the right time? So um, middle school, high school, you know, I, I lived with my father um, and he basically trained me to be an entrepreneur. So coming out of coming out of school, my whole mindset was I'm going to be a millionaire from being an entrepreneur. I didn't know what business I would go into. You know, I had sold candy in school and then after that, I sold CDs and clothes. Um, but I just knew that in some form of shape, I was going to own a business but I hadn't figured out what business. Um, and so connecting with my friends that were rappers, I saw the lifestyle and I was, I was attracted to the lifestyle. I wasn't necessarily attracted to the business. I was attracted to the lifestyle. And because I wanted to keep that lifestyle, I created a business that would afford me to keep that lifestyle. And so that's, that's what happened. But school, no, I, I was an entrepreneur and I was also um, in drama and photography. And I was a phenomenal, um, I would say I was a better photographer than actor. I actually, my senior year, I actually won the um, the Ohio Award for like uh, amateur photographer. And it wasn't like a, a school award. It was amateur photographer, period, in Ohio. And so I, I still have artwork or uh, pictures hanging up in the, uh, the capital of Ohio in the, uh, the Columbus Museum. You know what I mean? So I was a great photographer. But in my mind, I, I couldn't get rich from photography. I actually, that was what I actually thought. But now I know I was wrong. But it's a great I know, skill I know set plenty to have. Of, I know plenty industry. of rich photographers now. Okay, but it's a great skill to have, nevertheless, yeah. for the music industry. Okay, but yeah, yeah. my bad. Continue. So no, no. I mean, that's that's basically that's that's the answer to your question. Um, that was where my mind was. I just wanted to. I just wanted to be a millionaire. Okay. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. Just some form of business. Got it. And then since you were around certain people that were trying to be artists, it just that was the right place, right time, and you just figure shit out. Like you just. Figure that well, out the problem, things they had problems with, and you figured out for them. And that's how it birthed. Yeah. So, well, I, honestly, I just went with them for fun. You know, I, I was like, "Oh, these guys are probably gonna have fun," but I had no idea how much fun. Like, you know, I was a sheltered kid. You know, my my dad is a, a major in the military, so it wasn't like I was going out to you know. And so when I got to start going to clubs and popping bottles and girls, and we riding in phantoms and. Oh no, I can't get this up. I need, <laughs> I need to figure out. I need to figure out how to keep this going. Right. So that, that was that was my motivation in the moment, you know. Okay. So somebody asked the question uh, that now, you know, in, uh, what is the day to day of J.R. McKee today? And I actually want to ask it uh, a little bit, like extrapolate on that. Is like, is there a major difference between the day to day of what it was like in the beginning when you're starting the label? And now mm -hmm. that you're more working with multiple, you know, big artists and small artists, perhaps like what's the day to day to handle all this? Well, so so I guess I'll start with the day to day back then. Um, my marketing strategy, lucky for me, it, it just aligned with my lifestyle um, because we were we were doing MySpace back then. That was the dominant you know platform, and so all I wanted to do back then, you gotta keep in mind, I was. 2021 20, when like I really started the label. So all I wanted to do was talk to girls. And so all we did was make music, upload to MySpace, and then talk to every girl we could find. And that turned out to be an amazing marketing strategy because the girls would take our song and add it to their playlist. You know, if you remember on MySpace, you had your own music. And so yep. so anytime we talked to a girl, she would make she would make my artist, she would put them in a top eight and she'll put his song on her, you know what I mean? So we were talking to every girl on MySpace, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that actually worked out amazing for us because it ended up turning us into one of the biggest artists MySpace had ever seen. Okay. Um, and the only one bigger was Soulja Boy. We were, we were, it was Soulja Boy than us really. And so that, that was the day to day. Every day we just woke up, talked to girls. Um, and, but that worked out because that spread our music tremendously. And then once we found iTunes um, or TuneCore and put our music on iTunes, that was like what changed our lives. Um, Cause like the very first month we made $30,000 on iTunes and every month after that, and still to this day, we make money um, from that same music. 
So that was my day to day back then. I woke up, taught the girls on MySpace. My day to day today is a lot different. <laughs> um, <clears throat> today, obviously, I have a family, so I wake up and take care of my kids with, along with my wife in the morning. You know, breast their teeth, etc. Right. Then I come to my office. Um, well. If I get my food, I actually wake up before they get up because I come to my office, I read my Bible, I pray. Then around that time, um, I either work out, sign up, then they wake up, brush their teeth, et cetera, et cetera, get them off to school, come back to my office, um, and I go through my emails first. This is a lot of information, but I guess y'all ask, so y'all want it. Yeah. I, go through my, <laughs> I go through my emails first, um, and then after I go through my emails, then I go through my phone um, and then I just literally I have a whiteboard that's sitting right here and it has all of my businesses on it. And so every top of the week, I write down like the like the real key things I need to get done inside of each business. And so I'm just constantly looking at that whiteboard every day. Like, what have I checked off the list? Like, did we get that done for that business? Did we get that done for that business? Yep. Um, and so like I even treat my artists like businesses like so they're on there, but they're in the same category as the businesses. I have wrote down what I need to get done for them. And so that's what I do all day long, basically, um, until it's time for, you know, to get back to the kids. Dope. And obviously, since you enjoy it, it probably doesn't all feel like work. I'm sure there's some aspects that feel like work that are not as enjoyable, yeah. but yeah, for the most part, it's a well, nice schedule. Most of the time in my office, it feels like work. Yeah, <laughs> it feels like it feels like work. Uh, the stuff that I do that's, that's not, that doesn't feel like work is things like this. Okay. Like talking about what I enjoy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. talking about like my passions, but when I'm in it, um, I won't say it won't feel like work. It, it does. Cause like, I'm literally like going hard, trying to get things done. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that Diddy clip where he get off the phone and he slam it down. Yeah. I can do anything. What else like can I do? Give it to yeah, me. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally in here, like trying to knock out points, like get it done, get it done, get it done. So when I'm in the office, it feels like work. Cause I'm trying to get it done. Get it. Cause I, I have so many businesses and so many things to do. I'm just like, get it done, get it done, get it done. And so, well, talking like this, oh, this I love. Like yeah. doing podcasts, um, doing doing the show that we're shooting, like doing my lives inside my community. Like that's the stuff that's that doesn't feel like work. No, I'm I'm with you. Yeah, that that is the most enjoyable part of being an entrepreneur yeah. if you're comfortable with getting yourself out there, which is a perfect transition to commandment number three, putting yourself yeah. out there, right? So this is my question to you, because I get this all the time from people that I meet, because I never thought I would be in front of a camera talking about anything. I was I still am an introvert, believe it or not, if anybody's watching and thinks I'm not. But what does you suggest, like, can you train yourself to have more confidence to get out there? A lot of people start saying, man, I can't do this. But yeah. I was the same way. I have certain things. I'm not, you know, this is your interview. I'm not going to get into what I did. But what, what's your suggestion? Like, what do you think art is or what, what have you done to train yourself to be more comfortable on camera or just face some yeah. of these fears to put yourself out there? Because a lot of people fear that from my understanding. Right. I think it's practice. It's repetition, right? Yep. So, you know, when I started making content, it was very bad. Like, I was still giving the same information, but, you know, I had, I, it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. I, I wasn't dressed correctly. I wasn't worried about lighting. And so as I did more and more content, the lighting got better. I started dressing better. I started worrying about aesthetic. I, I learned as I go. That's That's entrepreneurship, period. Like, you have to learn as you go. I think you know, um, Mate, Mate, maybe you know this saying, because I, I can't think of exactly how I go, but what's the one where it's like, you know, you you build the plane as it's falling down the sky, out of the sky, as it says for entrepreneurs, yeah. or whatever. I can't think of exactly how it goes, but... You, you're building the plane as you're flying, like you're, you're trying to figure yeah. out how to build the plane as you're flying. Exactly. So, like, that's what entrepreneurship is, you know what I mean? So, every day is like, we're going to figure it out. We're learning as we go. And so when you're, when you're talking about putting yourself out there, it's literally just doing and, and doing daily until you get good at putting yourself out there right now, putting yourself out there literally means content. You know what I mean? It literally means I want to tell my truth and my story through content, but you have to learn how to do that. And you're going to suck at first. You're going to be terrible. You're not going to have the right lights. You're not going to have any light period. Maybe you don't have a microphone. Like you just could learn as you go. And so, you get better and better until you're great at telling your story and, and telling your truth through content. Um, so yeah, my, my advice would just be start, do it daily and learn from the feedback you get online. You know what I mean? Um, the content that does well, you do more of it. The content that doesn't do well, you scrap it. Like, okay, I'm not going to try that again. I'm going to try something different yep. until I find what really works. Let me ask That's you this. Cause you, you do, you know, similar, um, uh, 
pieces on online, like, you know, 45 seconds to a minute kind of talks, mm-hmm. gems kind of like I do. How many, how many takes do you discard per like pose that you put up? Is it multiple takes so you're comfortable or is it, are you now much better no, than so, the first try? No. So, okay. So now, right now I do it differently. When I started, I was freestyling. Like I'm giving my, my journey. It's not a long journey. Um, but when I started, I was literally just freestyling. You know, I didn't have an editor or anything. I was editing everything myself. So when I started, I would just talk and then I would take it and like, you know, put it up. Um, then I found out about this app called Teleprompter. And so I started using Teleprompter where I would just write it and read it. And that worked really good for a while. I mean, this is the thing about the internet, like it's it all moves and trends, like things will work and then they won't work no more. So the teleprompter worked really good for a while. Um, um, but then that stopped working. Like it's like that authentic thing. Like I think it worked for a while, but then people started to feel like, oh, he might be reading that or something like that. So I was like, okay. I feel like it's not coming off authentic enough. So I, I scrapped the teleprompter. I stopped using that. And so what I started doing next was I started doing it um, podcast style. So where I had a podcast mic in front of me, but uh, instead of just freestyling, I would have a subject. So, I, so you know, my my um my shooter, my editor would give me a subject like, yo, JR, talk about SEO. You know what I mean? Or, or yo, JR, talk about tell the truth. Like kind of like how you doing right now, right? And so we'll take that and I'll try to keep it brief, and then we'll chop it in and, and you know post that. So that's that was kind of like it. So it started off freestyling, then it went to me writing it and doing it on teleprompter, and now it's like subject based. Like give me a subject, I'll talk about it. And what I do is I do content days. I, I had one today, Saturday. I had one Thursday, and so Thursday my my um my shooter and editor came over my house because we did it in my house this time, and we shot sixteen pieces of content, four outfits, four pieces of content each uh each outfit and so four different setups so we shot four different setups four different outfits four pieces of content each so we shot 16 pieces and i think we did that in about 60 minutes yep. and so now i have you know content for the next three weeks you know and so that's 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 how i do it um in this in this very moment i do content days i still have content for my last two content days so i like i never i never really run out i, I, I work hard enough to make sure i never run out that's dope. You know what I mean? So like if I if I didn't make any more content, I could probably go to at least February right now. You know what I mean? With with content. So that that's how I do it. No, man. I'm I'm learning from you because I gotta do the same. I've been kind of doing the same thing. I bring a bunch of uh different man. outfits either to the you know, office, which is the studio man. or in my house now. I finally got my books behind me, like a little library, man. so I'm comfortable there. Or try to do stuff, you know, on the fly when I'm in different places. One thing I'm not comfortable with, which I think is dope because it feels like it's very authentic and, and you're not like uh, having a whole crew to shoot this is when you walk around with a bunch of people on the street and you're just talking. And so oh yeah, turn, I've done know? some of those. I don't yeah. know if you've seen them. I, I've done some of those. Um, those are hard. The walking yeah, walking and talking is the hardest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are very difficult. But I would say too, just like, you only need one person to, to shoot our style of content. Like you really don't even need one, but if you're gonna have one person helps, right? Yeah. You only need one person, but that person needs to be very honest and they need to, and they also need to understand content. So like my guy, he always tells me, he's like, you know, if I'm talking too fast or if, if I'm, if, uh, if I come off inauthentic, you know what I mean? He'll calm down. You, you, you moving too fast. So it's like, you need somebody that can get almost like a director. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you need somebody you really trust that understand content because he's not giving me directions based on what he thinks. He's giving me directions based on what's worked for us in the past. You know what I mean? So he'll catch me when I'm in a wrong and he'll like, no, you need to do it like this because he knows that's that's what's worked before. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I would just say having that person that really understand you and understand content is, is, is crucial. What would be the number one advice you can give to somebody to get to a, a mindset where they can even start practicing and pushing through, right? Some people are so fearful of, of putting themselves out there on the camera that they can't even get to the part where they're like, you know, creating 10 pieces, yeah. discarding three, and see what people say. <laughs> My bad, I'm just getting over a cold. Oh, I would say start on live. That's how I started. Okay. I would go live and I would just get comfortable with talking to people. You know what I mean? So, and this is just my advice for how I did. Like I used to go live all the time just to learn how to like get my thoughts out in front of people. You know what I mean? Cause live is in front of the world. You know, in my mind, that's how I always feel. I feel like I was in front of the world. So go live a lot until you comfortable and and the great thing about going live 
is you get that instant feedback. Like people will tell you, oh, that's a good thought. Or, oh, and then you can clock that. Like, okay, let me turn that into a piece of content. Yeah. Let me talk. This is for people who are talking, right? Um, but if you're an artist, it may be a little different. Um, if you're an artist, I would say, I couldn't tell you how to start, but I, I'll at least give you this, Jim. If you're an artist, I'll tell you this. The best thing that's working right now is live audio, meaning don't shoot a piece of content and then overlay your song over it. What you need to do is do a live performance version of that song and then overlay that because live audio is working way better on, on social media right now. So that is one thing I'll tell you. But if I was an artist, I, honestly, I'm not going to lie, uh, Mateo, I think they got, they got it way easier than us. You already sung the song. All yeah. you got to do is act like you sing it. Right. We had to do takes and feel like we had to come up with what are we going to say? If I was an artist, it, it, I honestly would be ashamed of myself if I don't have, you know, 20 pieces of content that I ain't even put out yet because it's so easy. I set up the camera. I sing a song that I already sung and made a year ago. You know what I mean? So that's a great honestly, point. I just think that's way easier to us. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, their product is the song. So yeah. to, to be able to just get on, you know, camera and whether they're in the booth or in front of the, you know, their studio right. and just singing and rapping and whatever live, you're right. That, that's when a lot of you guys can start. So that, that's good information. Uh, let's get into commandment number four. Identify mm -hmm. your fan and engage. This, this is one of my favorite ones because it's now starting to get in the business part of it. Yeah. So yeah. what would you, like, and this is going off of the last question that we had. So once you start putting yourself out there and you're a little bit more comfortable, what are some of the other topics you would recommend artists to engage with their fan base on other than their music? Like what are the, some of the things you've seen right. some of your so clients and artists do? Yeah, this one is start. Like you, you, you have to. I mean, sorry, this one is start. Before you start, you have to identify your brand. You know what I mean? What do you want to stand on? You know what I mean? Because the the fact that we have to put out two, three pieces of content a day, you know, as an artist, I can't. Like I can, but it, it wouldn't serve me well to only put out music content. You know what I mean? People, people need to hear my story. They need to hear my truth. And so, a part of my brand is going to be the keys. You know, three to five keys. So, for example, if I'm an artist but I'm also a single mother. You know what I mean? That can be a part of my brand. It's part of my story, but it's also part of my brand. So like, I'm here to help empower single moms or, just, or I could just say mom's period. I'm here to empower, empower other mothers. So now, you know, three times a week, I'm giving them content that's empowering to them. And maybe I have some lyrics that is empowering to single moms. And so now when I put that content out, I can overlay my song that has those specific lyrics yep. over it. And so I'm just trying to empower them using every tool I have. So maybe it's my lyrics, you know, maybe it's my story. Maybe I can show you a video of me, you know, paying off a, a bill that's been past due. That's empowering to people. It's like, cause so many people have past due bills and it's like, man, as a single mom, I was finally able to catch up. And I, and you share that online. Now that's a viral video pulling people back into your, into your world. You know what I mean? And so you have to identify your brand. So that's one thing that could be a part of your brand. If you're a single mom, a big part of your brand key or one of your brand keys could be, you know, mom empowerment. Or let's say I'm a, I'm a rapper. Um, and <clears throat> my father died at a young age. And so I had to, uh, I had to raise my two siblings that's under me. You know what I mean? A, a big part, like it's, it's kind of using your story as your brand key, but a big part of your brand could be, you know, um, uh, I'll just say youth, you could be a youth advocate. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so just find, finding things that you identify with. Like for me, when I came up with my brand keys, I identify with being an entrepreneur because that's what I was trained to be. You know what I mean? I was trained to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to help other entrepreneurs. And so that's why one of my brand keys is entrepreneurship, which is why several times a week, you're going to get content from me speaking to entrepreneurship. You know what I mean? The, the best part about identifying your brand keys is now I have a roadmap of what content I need to make. I know the story I'm telling online. You know what I mean? So that's what I would say when, when you're trying to when you're trying to uh, figure out what content to make is what is your brand? Figure that out and then make content solely and only around your brand. You never want to be off brand yep. because the other thing you got to understand is your content attracts people and you want you want to attract your people. As soon as you make a piece of off brand content, they send it to, you know, let's uh, I don't know the example I can give you, but I'll just give you the the reverse of it. If you make on brand content, if you're making content about entrepreneurship, it's going to show it to people who have interest in entrepreneurship. Yep. Like for, for example, if I like, if I like a bunch of twerking videos on Instagram, 
for the next month, <laughs> Instagram gonna show me nothing but twerking yeah. videos. You know what I mean? But if I like entrepreneurship videos on Instagram, it's gonna continue to show me entrepreneurship yeah. videos. And that's how you as an entrepreneur show up on my page because you make content about entrepreneurship. And so the algorithm does a job of finding your audience for you, but it can't do that if you're not making content based on on your brand to, to go out there so it can go out there and find that. And so that, that would be my advice yeah. is figure out, figure out your brand. Your brand keys is the most important thing you ever figure out in your business. The brand keys. Keep that in mind, everybody that's watching this. And you know what? That's how I discovered, that's how I became a huge fan of Nipsey Hussle. I first yeah. saw his reels or, you know, his snippets of content, just being a, a, a young, smart, entrepreneurial minded artist, yeah. spitting game. And I was like, man, I just love this person for his personality. And then... Right. You know, I started listening to his music and it was dope. And he wasn't like a particularly super talented, like unique rapper, in my opinion, you know, or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, but you love because, him. Yeah, bec because I loved him, like I immediately, he would have to really suck for not for me not to vibe with his music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I still would have yeah, liked him yeah. regardless. Like, I kind of felt the same way. Like, I... I liked his music, but I loved him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And because I loved him when he dropped, I listened. Yes. You know what I mean? And I always I always would critique it like, man, he could have did this better, he could have that better. But it never it never took me away from how much I loved him. Right. Because I didn't love him for his music. I loved him for being Nipsey. Yeah. I am with you. And I think uh, one uh artist that came to mind that I wanted to give as an example to all the artists on here watching is Action Bronson did a oh, dope yeah. job of, of with him and his food and the cooking because that's not yeah. usually things most artists combine like there's a lot of artists like 50 cent rick ross jay-z they combine entrepreneurship rihanna combines entrepreneurship right. with their artistry right j-lo does the same thing but it's i can't think of uh many artists that combine being a chef and you know right. food with 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 uh um with music, which is he's definitely one of the first and still one of the best to do it. You know what I mean? I think he even has a TV show, right? Yeah, now he does. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, or, you know, Snoop's the only one that comes to mind where this man is such an icon. Like he had a, right. you know, he's got a Cadillac deal. He was a voice on a Garmin GPS. He's with Martha Stewart. You know, now doing his own cooking show. Like that's the only brand that is just so well known that anything he does, people are gonna yeah, love it because they love him. It's and, gonna win. And it started with his music. So those are all examples you guys can do, and you're right. If, and if you're telling the truth in your own brand, it's just that much easier. You don't have to think about how to swing things or think about how to, not saying lie, but how to be a fictional yeah, character yeah. and prepared. Like all that, it just takes a lot more time. Um, okay, so in that chapter on uh, commandment number four, identify your fan page, fan and engage. You talk about um, analytics and how you can use those to figure out who mm -hmm. the fan is. But what I want to ask you is. What have you seen uh, is the one mistake that artists actually make when looking at their analytics and they misread the analytics? What what comes to mind when you uh, see artists like jumping into the analytics for the first time and they're just completely misreading it and it could be to their detriment? Um, I, you know, I haven't seen, I won't say like people making mistakes from reading their analytics. I mean, the mistake is not reading them. You know what I mean? That would, that would be what I would say is like the mistake is not paying attention to them. But I, I will say this, like a lot of people, when they look at the analytics, they don't know the difference between, you know, um, they don't know how to identify a hit record or identify, you know, a potential. Let's just call it, they don't know how to identify potential. Um, and that was one of my biggest blessings early on is I got to see so many analytics that I became a, like an expert at. Like it's, yeah. it's like stocks. Like if you're a stock person, you can read it so well that you can begin to tell the future. You know what I mean? Because you know, and so that's how I am with analytics and streaming. Like I can read it so well that I can tell you when something's going to be a hit. You know, I can tell you when something should. And so, so I, I would say their mistake is not reading it at all. You know what I mean? But what, what I would advise them to do when it comes to analytics. So content, again, everything is pretty much revolves around content right now. Um, that's just the, the era we're in, but Content moves streams, you know what I mean? And so when you see that jump in your streams, it's gonna be related to a piece of content or, or multiple pieces. So my job is always to go and find what piece of content moved the streams so I can replicate it, so I can share it with more people, you know what I mean? Whether that be my content that we made on our artist page or user-generated content, that, that doesn't really matter to me. I just wanna find that content because if that content made the streams jump from 100 daily streams to a thousand daily streams, 
there's something there. Yeah. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that piece of content. I'm gonna share, like say, let's say it's user generate. I'm gonna share it on my artist page. I'm gonna take it from their page and put it on our page. I'm gonna um. I'm gonna share it across all his social media platforms. Then I'm gonna figure out, is it trendable? Like, will multiple people do something like this? Cause if it is, then I'm gonna hire multiple people to do something like it. I'm not gonna wait, I'm gonna hire them. But if it's not, then I'm just gonna say, okay, how can we make more content like this? You know what I mean? Like people obviously love this, okay. Let's say it was a, a piece of content where a girl is out of date, out on a date with their boyfriend and it's just something cute about the way she fed him. You know what I mean? I'm going to go to my artist and I'm like, hey, bro, where's your girl at? <laughs> like, Y'all yeah, right. yeah, need to go out on a date and capture some video in a similar format and let's see if we can replicate this. You know what I mean? Like, like all we're doing is just trying to spread, trying to spread the music, but the way to spread the music is through content. So if I can give you a good piece of content, I can up the streams. And once we up the streams, what that does is now more people hear the song, now my likelihood of a user making the piece of content that's going to change our lives goes up. You know what I mean? Even going back to hours and hours, we put that song out there and a, a certain person made a piece of content that I saw and I was like, okay, this could be a trend, but they wouldn't have been able to make that content had they not heard the song. Yeah. And so my job is to put it in front of as many people as possible so they can hear the song and hopefully it sparks something in them to go create a piece of content that can one day change our lives. Yeah, no, I love that. So you're basically telling artists, make associations or correlations of what the data is telling you and how is mm -hmm. that is uh, correlating or resulting the streams and yeah. things like that. Um, and the fact that number one mistake is not looking at the analytics. That, that's Yeah, because imagine, imagine when it jumped from 100 to 1,000 streams. Imagine if we missed that because we never looked. We never could have found, we never would have found that piece of content that could have potentially right. sparked this song being a hit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just would have went unnoticed and we would have kept going about our lives wondering, you know, when we're going to finally get our hit record. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's why we pay attention to the analytics literally every day. Yeah. Uh, one uh, thing I can offer, remember we were talking about this, it's your one percenters group as well. The one mistake that I'm unfortunately seeing because of what the music industry has become, specifically with the Spotify, you know, bullshit Spotify bot streams, is that artists yeah. make a mistake only looking at their Spotify account after they got on the playlist thinking that is real traffic and making the mistake of not looking at Apple Music, um, Amazon, yeah. and everything else and asking critical questions is like, okay, so I just got 100,000 streams and 20,000 listeners, but how come it's not As trickling down Apple. anywhere else, right? Because there's no content yeah. to tie that to. They think that the playlist is not making them famous, and that's one thing I would say is be, be careful with that because, unfortunately, music industry is one of the most unregulated industries out there and there's no watchdogs. And if the artists fall for that, you know, you may have to fall for that multiple times, waste a lot of money and hopefully not ruin your Spotify account and don't get kicked off. But that's one thing I would tell people to watch out when it comes to analytics. Cause I'm just like you, man, I love because me being an entrepreneur and sort of a, a technical, you know, enthusiast, I was always in the technology. That was the first thing that like I always looked at in every business, sometimes yeah. even, too much you know I, you might have heard that term paralysis of analysis right like you're looking at the analytics too damn much and you can't make a decision because you gotta be yeah. able to make a decision fast in business so that's another thing to watch out for um so commandment number five it's a perfect transition and i love this one as well especially in the independent age which has never been easier especially in 2023 2024 is you tell artists to sell early like sell merchandise right. early but right. it's not always easy to train your fans to become a consumer of yours, of the artist, mm -hmm. even though they're consumers of God, everything else on this planet. But how do you, what are some of the best uh, early pieces of advice you would give somebody that's starting out with a low amount of fans to train their couple hundred fans, couple thousand yeah. fans of uh, purchasing from right. them? So, so you, you're saying the right word, it's, it's about training. Because I, I've seen a number of situations where the artist blows up, but they never trained their fans to buy from them. And so when they put out that first piece of merch, nobody buys it because that's just not what my fan base is trained to do. But if an artist, you know, that has never blown up, has trained their fan base properly, they can make six or seven figures off that fan base a year right. because their fan base is used to supporting them in that way. And so the way that you do it is, again, it's going with small numbers. Let's say we have... I'm gonna say community members, not not followers. So if you found a way to push a hundred people into a Discord or a hundred people into a broadcast channel, or you know a hundred people into your community, right? You always you need two things: you need scarcity and exclusivity. 
the biggest brand in the world, well, not the biggest brand, but the biggest brand that we're familiar with of selling is going to be Michael Jordan and the Jordan shoes. The Jordan shoes have become the biggest brand because of scarcity and exclusivity. Their exclusivity because he only, he only, um, I'm not the only, their exclusivity is because of the price point. You know, they make sure it's not affordable for everybody. They want an exclusive amount of people to wear it. I mean, they want an exclusive people to wear it. And so they put it at 265 a shoe. You know what I mean? And then they they create scarcity by only putting out, I don't know the actual number, but let's say they only put out 100,000 pairs yeah. when it's obviously 300 million people. You know what I mean? And so they create exclusivity and they create scarcity with the pricing. So that's what you want to do when you're putting out your your first thing that you're selling. Let's 100 people, man, I'm going to sell y'all five, but it, I'm going to sell y'all five or something. You know what I mean? Um, and not only, it can't just be about, it can't just be a piece of merch with your, your logo slapped on it, though. Like, that's what I was trying to tell people. Like, it has to mean something to you for it to mean something to them. Um, and so if I'm a, a up-and-coming artist, I've got my first 100 people in my community, my first 100 supporters, you know what I mean? I'm going to think about something that has helped me get to this point or something that's very near and dear to me. You know, it could be this journal and I'm going to make five copies of this journal and share it and sell it to you guys. Or it could be, um, you know, my first ever album that I put out, you know, five years ago, I'm going to sign it and I was going to come with, like, you just got to find something to make, make it, you got to share how it matters to you for it to matter to them. Yeah. And then that, that exclusivity is going to be there because you're only going to sell it to a small... I mean, that scarcity is going to be there because you're only going to sell it to a small amount of people. The exclusivity comes in because you have to be in the community in order to buy it. Like, I'll tell the word about it. Like, I may have 10,000 followers, but only 100 community members. So I'm going to tell all 10,000 followers, hey, man, I'm selling five of these, but the only way to get it is be a part of my community. That's how you create the exclusivity yeah. and you create the scarcity by that small number. Now... You can sell them for five dollars. Okay, boom, you made twenty five dollars. But it's not about the money. It's just training the people. Like, hey, I need y'all support in a financial and a monetary way. And so, boom, when I get to five hundred followers, I may sell ten, or I may sell twenty five. When I get to a thousand, I may sell, you know, fifty of something. You know, and so just always keeping it super, um, super scarce, meaning small numbers, and always keeping it exclusive, meaning the only way to get it is to be a part of this. You know, and likely that's going to be a community. Yeah, a lot. That's a huge gem for any artists out there. Don't mistake your followers for actual fans, and that you call them community members. Yeah. And that that's probably the biggest gem, you know, uh, of that chapter is like your community members slash your fans are the people that will be likely to buy, or that could be likely yeah. to train to be your consumer. The other right. ones, you probably, you know, the, the don't even assume don't have that expectation because you're gonna get your feelings or thinking that if you have 10,000 followers that you'll convert 10% of those no's once you build that community of a thousand community members you can yeah. probably have a chance of selling 10% of those and that's you know a good way yeah. to think so I, I love that because I, I tell it to all the clients and artists I work with you know create these fans get their email addresses like once you get their email address and phone number that's when you start even considering okay this might be now a fan moving forward follower right is a vanity metric to me. You can have, we can have a lot of followers, but they may not ever engage or care to. Exactly. Um, exactly. So you, have to, you have to push them into some sort of exclusive community, yeah. like say Discord, broadcast channel, um, just some sort of community. Um, I use a, a, a place called Grouped, um, but wherever you use, just push them into something that you have direct access to them. You know what I mean? You can email them or you can text them, something that, something that allows direct access. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge gem. Um, Moving to uh, commandment number six. Well, but I, we, oh, we've been ahead. on an hour, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to miss the questions because I definitely yeah. got to get off at two thirty. I don't want to miss the questions. Okay. So th this is the last one that I'm going to ask you. Then we're going to go to the questions, okay. and it has to do with oh. the trial and error uh, commandment, right? And that's yeah. like one of my favorite sayings uh, in entrepreneurship: is fail as fast as possible, as often as possible, because that's learning. Or yeah. if you can't measure it, you can't imp you cannot improve it. So I want to ask you, how do you document your errors? How do you document your fails? Man, they're scarred in my brain. <laughs> they're scarred in my brain. <laughs> nah, I mean, I I wish there was a better answer other than honestly, I just, I, I don't document, I just, I literally remember. Like, I know like, okay, we tried that, it didn't work. Um, I, I think the the main thing is is making sure you 
making sure you learn from them. You know what I mean? So I always analyze. So, okay, that didn't work. I may not go too deep into why it didn't work, but I just remember it didn't work. And I'll try to figure out how can I do it better. You know what I mean? Um, so, I, I'll give so, you a so perfect you example. Mean, you may want to try, uh, just sorry to interrupt you, but I've, I've been doing this thing now for five years right. and I think it's helped me because you know, we have so many moving pieces in our lives. I'm sure you do as well. Multiple businesses is that sometimes I forget and I make the same mistake twice, but I've been, I have these mm. columns in the Google sheet, like HR, yeah. marketing, you know, uh, development, uh, life, health, relationships. And I just put like my big fails, like what not to do again. So I can kind of review it, you know, once a year, there's not too many, it's just the big ones, but That's that has helped. My wife would love that because she wants me to remember everything I did wrong to her. She wants, she wants me to remember everything I did wrong to her for sure. So she would she would eat that up. Uh, no, nah, honestly, I, I really just you know re remember. Like I just I, I don't forget. But I, I was gonna say is like I, I try so much. I, tr I people never remember like my failures, but I do. I remember. You know what I mean? Like I I don't forget. Um, but I often tell you like something I'm trying right now. So I'm, I'm going on this tour. I put the tour out. Um, I did the first one as like a test run, as a trial. So I did the first one, it sold out. I was like, okay, people do like this. Um, they love the information, they love very happy. So I said, okay, I'm gonna take it on the road. But the, uh, another part of the trial was the the content I shot for to you know announce the tour. Um, when I did it the first time, I, I put it up there, I just call it raw. And then this one I did, I had edits to it. So, you know, if you, you see content where it has like, like when you're talking, it has different things that pop right. up. This one I did edits to, I said, okay, let's see if the edits work better than just, just the, the clean video. And I put it up and the edits actually did about 50% as well as the clean video. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's a lesson. Okay, well, they like the clean video better. So next, the next video, I'll make sure it's clean. And so like, literally I just go through those, those steps. I'm like, okay, let's try some, even though it worked last time, I never stop trying new things yeah. because it's like, I tell this to my artists many wells. I always want to find the new thing that works before the old thing stops working. So even though I know that that works, I'm going to keep trying new things because I don't want to put myself in a position where the old thing stopped working and I haven't figured out the new thing yet. Yeah. So I'm always, even though it's working, I want to keep trying new stuff because I want to figure out the next thing that's going to work before this stops working. You know what I mean? And, and that's how I operate. No, that makes sense. That's a good way to do it. And uh, one last question I'm going to ask, uh, ask you before we get into the other questions from the um, participants today. And I always love to ask as any entrepreneur I sp speak to, in the last five years, either from your business life or personal life, what has been one of your biggest failures that also ended up being a huge groundbreaking moment or like a shift in your thinking or just a huge lesson, period? My biggest failure that was a, a, a huge lesson um <clears throat> i would i would say me being new and uh, i'm glad you said the last five years because it wouldn't apply to this year but the last five years i started investing about five years ago 2018 i started in, well i've been investing i started investing in private companies like i always heard about you know um angel investing in, in mm. venture capitalism. And so I, I got to finally start making my own angel investments in, into, into venture capital in 2018, exactly five years ago. And so the biggest lesson I've learned from that, and, and I hate to say it because it's like people always say it, but I, I, I've learned it firsthand now is you're really investing in the person, not the idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I the, the companies that have not succeeded and I, I none of them have been complete busts. like none of them have went out of business yet so i haven't i don't have any complete bust stories but the ones who are not succeeding or, and not doing well i can look at the founder and be like mm, did i really believe in them i, I love the idea but i never really believed in them versus the ones that are really working where it's like i really like i would have trusted that person no matter what they told me you know what i mean and so i, I i've learned firsthand now you're not investing in the idea, you're investing in the person. Cause that's been my biggest lesson. Uh, Cause to me, my my VC investments, my angel investments are probably the most important de business decisions that I, I've made. Like everything else, I, I was, maybe I shouldn't say most important. Every other business I've done, 
I I've done it well because it's I know what I'm doing. Right. And you were Invest in charge. Yeah, I was in control. That's the point. I was in control. Yeah. Investing in other people's business, I have zero control over that. Yeah. And so I will say it's not the most important decisions I made, but it's the biggest decisions I made because I have no control over it. Yeah. And I'm putting 25 plus in these companies. And so it's like, these are big, these are, this is a big thing, you know, a big deal. And so learning that work, cause I, I really do feel like my investments are going to secure my family's future. Everything I'm doing, our future is pretty much already secure, but I still feel like these are the things that's going to make sure no matter what happens, everything down the line will be okay. And so these are big decisions to me. And so I guess I, I guess to say I put the most stock and the most faith in those decisions. And what I've learned in five years is that moving forward, I got to love that person in the sense of like, I feel like they're going, like they're going to do what they say they're going to do. No, they're going to go all like, they're going to be all go all out until they accomplish their mission. And so those are the type of people I'm going to invest in. The idea matters, but not as much as the person. The person matters way more. That's huge. That's what I've learned. No, yeah. uh, that's a huge gem. Uh, something I'm going through as well, you know, about to approach 40 years of my life as an entrepreneur, constantly learning how do you choose the people better? Like how can you get A plus yeah. players? Or especially when you invest into a business as a venture, you know, capitalist or just an angel investor, because you're right. You, you want to invest in the businesses that you're not going to be a part of because that's not why yeah. you're investing in there. You're not trying to create yourself another job and have to get into right, the weeds, right? right? You've got to believe in that business model, but better yet, the person that's huge. So look, man, uh, the book, guys, I'm, uh, we're yeah. going to get into the questions. Just, just get the book. Order it online in the physical form or audible. I like to do both. I get the audible. I'm going to get your book in uh, physical form because it's going to go in my library for sure. So uh, make sure you get the book because we didn't cover the last four commandments, but it don't matter because we're going to continue getting some questions and get JR to uh, spit some gems um, for everybody. And that I'm going to start with this question. Uh, that is one of the newer ones that just came on the feed. What is your perspective on the ageism in hip hop? I, it doesn't exist anymore. You know what I mean? That's just a, a, a negative mindset that's, from the past that you can let go of. Um, because now again, the, the fans have complete control. There was ageism because only a certain demographic were the premier people watching that television show or a certain demographic were the premier people listening to that radio station. But now the television show and the radio station don't exist. Now me as a person can reach everybody in the world. So the people who don't care that I'm 40 and rapping, I can reach them. And there are millions of them. I can go platinum being 50. And I think there are some rappers that have probably have done that, but still nevertheless. And then the bigger key is now my age is part of my story and my uniqueness that will attract people. Because now people will say, have you seen a 40 year old rapper? You know what I mean? So now, and now it's actually, it's just turned into a benefit. You know, whereas before it was a, to my detriment, now it's to my advantage. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm going to use every everything that's unique about me, I'm going to use it to my advantage. If I'm 45 rapping, that is unique. So now when I'm putting out my songs, I mean, my content is going to say, you know, it's going to have some part of my story is going to be on there. Uh, have you heard this 45-year-old rapper? It's probably what's going on my headline is going to be because I know that's going to make people stop and listen. You know what I mean? And now that they stop and listen, they love it, and I've created a fan. Yeah. You know, and so I'm going to make sure I'm going to put it on blast. I'm going to make sure everybody knows I'm 45 rapping. You know what I mean? I'm going to use it to my advantage is my point. Yeah, no, that, that's a good answer. Um, let's get to another question. And b- before you leave, let me know when you like got five minutes left, because I want to make sure okay. you can tell okay. people how they can find you. Obviously, you got the jrmckee.co underneath your yeah. um, your profile there. Um, but I want you to get in the details of like what else uh, you can offer to artists. But there's another question, which I think a lot of artists ask me this all the time. It was coming from the portion where we're talking about putting yourself out there and what are you used to record and things like that. But the artist wanted to know, what are you used to record yourself as a musician? Like when you said, uh, just man, just do your song live. What do you think is the mm-hmm. setup they need to do one of their songs live? Right. Again, um, let me just, well, let me just say I'm not an audio engineer. That's a better question for you. <laughs> That's a much better question for you. So, I mean, I, I'll, I'll pass that one to you. Uh, Look, starting with the phone, you know, one, 
a mistake that I think I made early on just because I was so passionate about the music industry. I bought too much damn equipment. I got like $40,000 of equipment sitting behind me. And most of the musicians we work with in the rap, R&B, and pop world, we never use nothing more than a microphone and the Avalon preamp. You know, so yeah. I might have used like the analog channels for, for mixing and things like that, but everything was coming from the UAD box, which is universal audio plugins. The computers nowadays are at that level. But even before then, you know, like, yeah, have, have a microphone like I have in front of me. You can get a super dope condenser microphone for $300 that you could set up into a, uh, a quality $100, you know, uh, fork is right um, interface and then just use your iPhone. Honestly, at this point, and I'm not a video guy, you know, I know enough about audio, but uh, these like black magic cameras, the reds for 40,000, like you don't need that. There's, you can uh, look at YouTube videos of dope videographers showing you what they can do with the latest iPhone 15 and how the consumer cannot tell the difference between a $50,000 red camera, especially yeah. for the t content JR is talking about, just for you to get, uh, you know, into a certain environment, a scene, whether it's outside in the city or on a green grass pasture or in your room, like recording yourself going live. And some of the girls and artists I've seen like going viral on TikTok, they're just purely, they're not even using the mic. They just get their regular iPhone with the microphone yeah. that it has on it. And they just right. strum the guitar and sing. And if they're good, it, it could go. You know what I'm saying? It's that simple. Um, yeah. I'll say I got an artist. She uses GarageBand. She records on her phone. Yeah. She has like the, the iPhone headphones, the ones with the string though. Um, and she records from her iPhone on GarageBand. Um, and the only thing that we do is we get it mixed by a professional engineer, but all the recording is done right on her iPhone into her iPhone uh, headphones um, using GarageBand. Okay. Now, I have another question from, uh, it seems like a, a, a label owner from Brooklyn. Uh, name is Leaf, I think. I'm a recording studio and beginner label owner in Brooklyn. I have amazing talent uh, recording with us regularly. Uh, so regular art, you know, dope artists come through all the time and they have uh, huge catalogs of music. Um, a lot of hot hits as to you know what they're listening to. I want to put out a mixtape with about 12 of these artists hip hop mainly in R&B with the best hit songs of their catalogs on this mixtape. What do you think is the best way to put out a project like this in your opinion? That's a good question. Is he saying that all of the artists are signed to him? Um, yeah, uh, comment on them, uh, Leaf, if they're signed to you. I I'm gonna make an assumption, let's say they're not under contract. You just have a bunch of dope artists coming through your studio because you're a studio owner. Because that, that would be, I, I used to have okay, that happen so, yeah, in my let's studio. Let's say they're not under contract. I mean, this is the beauty of where we are. You know, every distribution company now has full splits in size. Like, you can, you know, split, like, let's say, because you're marketing and promoting a project, you may get 10% and then the artists get 90%. You know what I mean? Like it's it's really up to you and whatever you and the artist discuss. And so literally I would just go to each individual artist, work out a deal. We're going to split. Like I don't have to pay any money up front. Like we're all going to split the profits here and I'm going to help market and promote this. Right. Um, so that would be the easiest way. Like, hey, man, every artist on here. Hey, you know, I'll give you whatever percent makes sense to what you did to the song. Um, and we'll all get a cut and we'll put it up like that to me because of where we are distributors companies and all of them you can input splits we don't i don't really pay for a lot of things anymore like when I, even on my end like when i go to other artists and we need things you know i just tell them hey you know i'll give you x amount for this uh percentage for the other song and they'll be good with that usually because everybody likes that passive income because usually when you pay for a feature you pay them the money and they'll get like points but, but are they ever going to see that money probably not right. but if i just put them directly on the splits they know that they're going to see that money every month yeah, you know what I mean. So that's that's how I've been working it out with 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 major artists, honestly. That's dope. And there's a similar question to that from another um, participant, Robert. He's asking, you know, he's his own uh, record label, he owns his own publishing company. What's the best way to receive a return on his investment? Is it through actual merchandise or is it through uh, placements uh, with other artists and royalties? Uh, what would be a take on that between those like options? Um, he's a he's an artist or he's a label owner and he wants to know how to receive a return on his yeah, investment. And he's an artist as well, and he has his own publishing company. So I'm assuming he's you know crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's on his publishing, registering all of his stuff. But what do you think is the like that is a good question. What is the fastest way you think as an artist can get your return on your investment? Whether you invest in a bunch of money or, or just on every, so he anything, I just want to publishing he signed or into merch. a publishing deal. 
No, he's asking, is it through, like, what are the, what are oh, some yeah. of the vehicles? Is it through publishing? Can you get it faster? Can you get it faster through merch at first? Or what, what's the so, vehicle? Right, right, right. I mean, I'll just keep it really simple. The fastest way to get a return on your investment, if you're investing in artists in general, is going to be selling products other than streams. You know what I mean? Because music is a product, but if you sell it via streaming, they're getting paid 0 0.003 cents. So a thousand streams, that's $3. Versus if you say, okay, I'm going to sell it direct to the fans, um, let's say using like an even.com or I build my own website, whatever you do, and you sell it for a dollar, well, if even three people buy, you've already made more than you would have made from a thousand streams. Um, so easiest way to make return on investment is sell products. You know, number one, start with music. Um, then you can sell merchandise. You can sell experiences. You know what I mean? I'm going on my own tour um that's that's an experience that i'm selling versus versus selling the physical product right um so if this artist has any sort of fan base that he can go and put 50 people in the room well then he can make some money you know um so i i just think i just know that products are always going to make you more money than music unless you're selling the music you know what i mean yeah. if you can sell the music and you can sell products that's how you're going to make money and that's why everybody in the industry is trying to push people into selling direct to consumer. The fans want it. You know what I mean? It's not like the fans wouldn't buy for you. I've I've literally proven that already with the artists that I work with. We've sold tons. Um, so it's just about you selling whatever you want to sell, product, merchandise, et cetera. But if you want to make your money back, start selling something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Today. Yeah, no, that's good. And building off of that, there's another question that kind of fits this scenario. So once you start selling something or selling yourself out there, uh, she wants to know, uh, I think it's, it's a lady, Anta, uh, is a artist on the local scene, as far as local resources that are available, would you suggest first network, going to networking events that are in the music industry or first going to showcases, artist showcases? I don't understand why you couldn't go to both. All right. Yeah, um, yeah networking yeah. events and, and showcases. So I would say showcases give you a better opportunity to create content. You know what I mean? So like me rapping on stage, that's content. You know, if I get somebody to record that, you know, that's great content. Versus a networking event, I'll get to meet good people, and that's that's always good. But for me, I'm, I'm going to go to both. But if I had to choose, like, Dag, tonight is a networking event, tonight is a showcase, I'm going to choose the one I had the most control over because if I can make content and that content – do numbers, I'm in a much better position. So the people who I would have met probably would want to reach out to me anyway right. because I just made this great piece of content and everybody saw it. So I have much more control if I can create content. Um, so yeah, I will go where I can create the content. Yeah, that, that's a good answer. Um, and then there was one question that I really liked, I forgot who asked it, but it was basically when we we're talking about like how do you manage your day-to-day -day stuff and you say you have this whiteboard where you have all your businesses and plans for the week and you're putting your like top things you got to do for each business. The person was like, "Man, get specific. We want to know the details." So, pick one yeah, of those. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah tell me one out. thing you had on last week that was like a big one that maybe it you weren't able to get it done the week before that or before that. Like, it, it kind of kept you know like translating to each new I, week. I, that you I got you. Done. I got you. So, um, the bottom one on my whiteboard is Ten Artist Commandments, which is, which is my book. So, I did a podcast series where. It, um, Basically, I did it's a podcast capsule, I should say, 10 episodes that coincide with every commandment. And so I have, it says 10 commandment. Under that, my three things to do this week were, there were two episodes I hadn't recorded yet. And so I had to reach out to the people and make sure, so it says two episodes. I had to make sure I get those two episodes shot. Um, it says thumbnails. I didn't have thumbnails yet for the episodes that were already out in the upcoming. So I had to make sure I got those thumbnails. And then it said titles because I felt like the titles that I had on the episodes that were already out were not searchable enough. It, it wasn't good search engine optimization. And so I had on there to redo all my titles. And so I made like, if you go there now and you look at the three that are out, they all have what I consider good searchable titles. You know what I mean? And so that, those were the three things I had to do this week specifically for that book. I had to get those other two episodes done. I had to get thumbnails done and I had to redo the titles. And so that's what's under there. I like that, man. I appreciate you getting diving deeper into that. Let me see. There's a lot of questions, man. I appreciate everybody getting on today and participating. Um, this is a good one because I get as this a lot as well. 
uh, as an artist, especially um, up and coming in the beginning stages, should you put out an album or a single or a project or a single? Yeah. Well, singles are better. Um, <clears throat> number one, if you go back to playlisting, they can only playlist one song at a time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you go to, you go into the algorithm. Um, every time I put out a single, the algorithm goes to work by emailing all of my followers on Spotify. It puts me into Discover Weekly. So the the algorithm, feeding the algorithm much better with singles. Um, and then albums is really just normally me repackaging those singles. But I really like albums for, for marketing purposes. It's a good tentpole event. You know, I can put all kind of marketing around an album, but I'm going to reach the most people with singles, you know? And so for me, I always put out as many singles as I can until I get to a moment where I won't say where they're demanding an album that's going too far, but I get to a moment where like things are really picking up. Like, okay, I'm having a really hot little streak here. Let me double down on that by putting out this project. And so that's how we put out our projects now. Like, whereas in 2021, we had them all scheduled out. Now it's more about, you know, how hot are we in this moment? Can we capitalize on that by putting out a project? And so that's what we always do. Um, and a better example would be, you know, looking at Manny Wells. He had about three or four videos in a two-week span, you know, hit a couple million views. And so to me, I'm like, okay, this is, he's having a little high streak. Let's go ahead and get the project packaged up and get it out. And so within the next three weeks, we had a project out. You know what I mean? And so we're really moving based on what the fans' energy is giving us. You know, and so we just capitalize on good moments by putting out projects. But other than that, we're just going to keep hitting them with singles. And since then, I think we still put out, you know, a couple songs. And that was like a month ago. So we just keep rolling. Yeah, I agree with you. Singles, especially in the beginning stages, once you have a lot of fans, I'm talking about thousands of dedicated fans, community members, because I love that word. Once you have thousands okay. of community members, then putting out an album actually gives you a better feeling because they digested the way you probably designed it to be digested as opposed to being, yeah. you know... Again, having your expectations crushed. Now, I want to one more question before I know you got to get going and you telling people where they can find you know that. But this is a good one because we've been talking about artists a lot. Uh, but what about like an audio engineer, right? They're a crucial piece of this industry. Uh, <laughs> what would you suggest to audio engineers in the beginning stages to get out there and like get their business <clears throat> off the ground? Well, this is amazing because in today's world, everybody is a brand. Everybody has their own TV channel, like they have their own social media. And so it doesn't matter what business, what industry, if you're somebody who is in business, meaning you're charging for your services or your product, you're in business, you need a brand. And so even as an audio engineer, I can turn myself in a brand into a brand. I can simply start documenting what I do for a living. You know what I mean? And I can start speaking on it. Like I, all you're doing when you're using, like if one of your brand keys is being an audio engineer, all you have to do is add value. So what does that mean? I, I get on there and I talk about things that add value to other audio engineers, or I educate people who don't know what it what they that they that they need an audio engineer. Like I'm finding ways to add value to the world using my expertise. You know what I mean? Um, and so I can pick a video and be like, man, if they would have had an audio engineer, they could they could have made it sound like this. And that video gets a hundred thousand views, and now my inbox is full of clients. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that that you have to turn yourself into a brand. No, that's a great, great question. I agree with that. And that you, you see, guys, a lot of other businesses do it. doesn't matter if you're selling diapers, literally, or yeah. cheesesteaks, or you have a food truck. Like, a lot of the companies that are succeeding, like independent small businesses starting out and, and you know, expanding, they are not shy about putting their brand out there and become, like, just telling the story, you know, behind mm -hmm. the scenes footage, all of that stuff. So, you know, to respect your time, man, again, Thank you so much for coming through. But before you leave, make sure you give artists not only your jeremykey.co on Instagram because everybody can yeah. see that the whole thing, but like what's your community about? How can they learn from you more? You know, how could you help right. everybody that logged on today? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> basically I started a community called the 1%. And I started for the first reason because I always like to practice what I preach. And so when I told artists they needed to make content, I started making content so I could show them, hey, it's possible. If I can do it, you can do it. Now, my main thing to artists is you need to be able to sell direct to your consumer. You can sustain a living from your music, but not from streaming. You know what I mean? Like, there's an example I saw even put out today where a person had 55 monthly listeners. <clears throat> so they didn't have any streaming presence, but they decided to sell their project. And I think they made $3,000. Right. 
right. from selling their project in, in um, seven days. And so you know how long it would have took them to make $3,000 from streaming? But then in seven days, they made it. You know what I mean? And so the point is, like, fans are ready to buy from you. But the only way to get them to buy from you is you have to build a community. Yeah. You have to have people who, like, really trust you and really like you um, or love you. And so because I know that they need to create a community, I create a community. And that, but my community's purpose is to teach them how to create community so that they can sell to their fans, so that they can sustain their business and make a living from their music. Um, and so that's what the one percent is all about. And it's called the one percent because our goal inside of there is to turn all of the creatives in there into the top one percent of their field. Because I, I do want it to be more than just music. Um, I want it to be all creatives. You know what I mean? Because every creative can build a community and build a brand and monetize it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's what we're inside of there teaching them how to become the top one percent of their field. And so um, you, if you go to jrmckee.co, um, my, my Instagram, the link is in the bio. It says join the one percent. Um, I'm also going on tour um, next year. I'm hitting five cities um, for a 2024 strategy tour. Um, you can you can check that out on my page. And then lastly, obviously, you can get the book. 10 Artist Commandments, you go to 10 Um, or you can go to Amazon. The audiobook is available, the paperback is available, and the ebook is available all on Amazon.com. Um, but yes, you can you can go in there. Um, you can come see me on tour. You can join the community. I, I should say in the community, what I do is I put out a weekly class. Mm -hmm. Every week I sit down and I point out basically what's going on in the industry right now and how you can take advantage of it. Or what do you need to know? Like how do you build community? I have a full class, full classes on how to build community. Um, so I have that weekly class as well as I get on live every week um, with my community members and talk through whatever issues they're having, you know, getting mentorship. So um, the community is the the most cost effective way to be ahead of the game. You know, it's ninety seven dollars a month. Um, and so it's the most cost effective way to like really stay in touch with me and really be ahead of the game, and really learn how to monetize. Um, and so I would always advise everybody to join the community, but even if you feel like you don't have that, the best thing you could do is read the book. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, book, the, is the dope. book has everything you need. And like I said, um, it's nine ninety nine. Um, so you can't beat that. Everybody has $10 to educate themselves. No, that's, that's the damn truth right there. So everybody get the book, check out his Instagram and look, I'm going to show everybody how they can quickly create behind the scenes content. Hey guys, we just got done with J.R. McKee, uh, dope interview about his book, 10 Artist Commandments. So it's going to be out in about a week, week or two. Make sure you stay tuned for that. It'll be on my YouTube channel, and you can connect with J.R. McKee and all the links that I'll provide in that video when we post it in the description and all that good stuff. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. There you go, guys. There's a, there's a quick video that I'll end up putting out a week from yeah. now. So, yo, J.R., man, appreciate you, my man. And look, I, I saw that post about your... Um, uh, the thing you're doing by traveling to like the five cities, the little tour, mm -hmm. and when yeah. you go to New York, man, I would love you know if you want to have me there, I'll, I'll come up this like, short drive from that's my backyard. That'd be amazing. Yeah. No, you 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 are for sure invited. I think the room I got because it's twelve hours per city, but I think the room I got holds sixteen. So we definitely got room for you. Got you, man. All right, I'll come and visit. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks for everybody who hopping on. We had a good turnout today, and I will see you all at the next accelerator class or the next interview that I'll do. Peace. All right. Peace, y'all. Thank you again. Yep. Thank you, man. Awesome. All right, bye -bye. All right my man. Yeah, I I'll hit you up. And, uh, you know, everybody's still in here, but uh, this is dope. This is one of my, um, man, I, there we go. Oh, JR left. So everybody that's on, appreciate you guys getting on. Uh, make sure, you know, if you're still in the comments, uh, join JR's, you know, pro, uh, his one percenters. If you're not in my accelerator, mine's is $60 a month. Very similar thing. We got classes, courses live q and a's i dive deep into people's like you know ads we we share screens we get into um diagnosing advertising and running ads and all of that because there's a lot of questions about you know like what's the best way to mark yourself initially a lot of good questions so i try to get to the good ones guys but all the other ones can be answered if you are either part of my community or jr's community but stay learning guys because uh, that's going to give you the advantage besides your talents to get to the next level if you continue to learn so, again, appreciate everybody taking their time on a Saturday. I know, you know, people got things to do, but the fact that you got in here today at 1 p.m. shows me that you all are ready to invest into yourself, period. You know what I'm saying? Whether you're a musician or producer, engineer, whoever, so I appreciate everybody's time because time is the most valuable thing we all got. So stay tuned for my next 
live session on Zoom for the accelerator or the next time I do a, a live interview like this because I got more interviews coming uh, in the new year. Peace, everybody.